Okay, so deep, take a deep breath. Here comes the loco stuff. Similar to statistics, generally students hate biochemistry. I don't know why. I hated biochemistry when I had to take it in high school or in college, really, um, because it was so, just so boring, it was memorization. But then I met this wonderful woman named Marilyn Fogel who taught me that you can study biochemistry with isotopes and you could do it in really cool things like sea otters. And then I was just like, I grabbed a biochemistry book and I read it front to back. It was just like the coolest realization. That, that stuff that I learned back in college, I had to learn back in college and memorize, that it could be used to study sea otters or whales or kangaroo rats. So don't, don't be afraid of biochemistry. It's actually not that complicated. Mm -hmm. okay. So the diet here, and as I mentioned before, we have different components of diet. Our diets are made of protein, carbohydrates, and fats, and they have different isotopic compositions. Okay, so that's one thing we're gonna talk about. There's some sort of discrimination that occurs, and we use these things to build our tissues, because that's what we measure as isotopic ecologists. We measure tissues, and those tissues are largely made of protein, okay? We measure things like bone collagen, or hair, or blood plasma, or red blood cells, or liver, and muscle. Those things are largely made of protein. Our bodies are largely made of protein, okay? All right. Of course, we assimilate these different things to different degrees, one second, and we can route them into tissues if we need to. We, we use that pool, of, that assimilated pool, to biosynthesize things. We biosynthesize protein, of course, to maintain our tissues or to grow. But we also need to make lipids and we need to make carbohydrates and all sorts of other things. And then, of course, like I mentioned, we excrete it. And the major form of excretion for carbon is CO2. That's the main way we lose carbon. Okay? Yeah. Um. Well, I'm more a plant person, so I don't know much about this, but I was wondering if stress can trigger a discrimination. We'll talk about that at, at the end, but yes, you can basically, as animals get nutritionally stressed, they can go from switching from eating exogenous things like food to eating themselves. And when you eat yourself, your isotopic balance, your nitrogen balance can change, and that's reflected in your nitrogen isotope values. Okay. So, protein cycling in animals, we have body protein, we have a lot of it, so it's a big fuel tank of protein that we have on board that we can always, as you just mentioned, we can always grab if we need. But we generally don't want to do that, right? We don't want to eat ourselves. We want to eat endogenous, or sorry, exogenous sources. There's dietary protein, and of course there's non-essential uh, amino acid analysis. As I'll mention in a little bit, there's two forms of amino acids. There's non-essentials that we can make de novo, and there's essential amino acids that we can't make as eukaryotes, and we have to get from our diets, hence the term essential, okay? All that stuff goes into an amino acid pool that sits actually in our blood plasma. The blood plasma is like the metro system of the body. That's our, our amino acid pool, okay? It's very well mixed. It has a bunch of different sources, and this is what we're using to do energy and to build tissues. Okay, so to maintain our bodies, or to grow if we're young, <clears throat> and to, to do work. And from that amino acid pool, of course, we have to maintain our body protein, like I just mentioned. We have to also create all these other compounds that are really important for doing metabolism, okay? And from that amino acid pool, we can also build, we can make glucose and glycogen, right? Like, like those things, the snicker bars over there, right? We obviously exhale CO2 and there's other things that we can make with it, fatty acids, steroids, and ketone bodies. So the point of this is that it's, it's a big, well-mixed pool, and you can do a lot of stuff with it, okay? All right. Okay, so we can take that, and this is where it gets a little crazy, but here's our food, and we have protein, we have carbohydrates that goes into this glucose pool, Right? And here's the animal amino acid pool and the body protein. So we can shuffle things back and forth between this amino acid and body protein pool if we need to. We have carbohydrates that go into the glucose pool. And then we have fats that go over here into this fat pool. Okay? So again, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. What do we do with these things? Okay? Well, the first thing we do, one of the major things we do with the glucose pool is we do glycolysis. 
Okay, here's the biochemistry. You guys have heard this term before, glycolysis. I know you have. Plants do this, animals do this, microbes do this. This is a major metabolic pathway in just about every organism on Earth. All right, and there's a lot of intermediary steps there, but basically you're taking glucose and you're turning it into this molecule, acetyl-CoA. There's like seven or eight steps that I've left out. I don't want to bore you to tears, but I wanted to show you that, at least for these, these are the important intermediaries that lead to amino acid production, which we're going to be talking about in a second. The second major metabolic pathway or, or, or system, really, is TC, the TCA cycle, okay? or the Krebs cycle. You've heard of this. It goes round and round, and it actually, I think, has 13 intermediaries. There's really two important that are important for isotopes <coughs> that I'll talk about in a second. Okay. Now what happens is during this process, glycolysis into the TCA cycle, you get decarboxylation. So CO2 is being shunted off here at various stages in the system, and that CO2 is light in comparison to gets what gets left behind. This CO2, by the way, is what goes into your breath and what you're exhaling. So these dark decar decarboxylation reactions, <clears throat> one happens here, and I think there's two more that happen in the TCA cycle, allow you to get rid of that 12 CO2, which leaves this body pool that you're using to build new amino acids, if they're not essential, isotopically enriched. Okay, that's it. There's also another thing that you can do here, is that you can make lipids, okay? So if you drink a lot of beer, or eat a lot of bread, you get fat. Okay, and the reason is, <coughs> Because <laughs> your plan, yeah. The reason is, because you brew your own beer. <laughs> um, the reason is, is because this acetyl-CoA, this is what you're basically using to build lipids. There's a bunch of little acetyl-CoAs in here, okay, to build this molecule, all right? And lipids, because, um, because they're built with a bunch of little acetyl-CoAs, they're isotopically depleted. They're made with 12C. And this is the main reason why lipids have lower carbon isotope values than do proteins. Okay, so there's a major fractionation that occurs right here. And you can make lipids from this, and this can go back up to here, or to put blubber on, because blubber actually is a really good energetically intensive resource that you can use when you can't find any other food. And a lot of animals use that, especially marine mammals. They stock up on their blubber stores, and then they don't eat for four months when they reproduce, and they basically chew through those blubber stores and able to do work and to live. Yes? Um, can you explain why there's more So there's a big car, uh, fractionation that occurs between the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. And basically that means that the acetyl-CoA here is, tw there's a 12C, it's, um, it's, uh, it has 12C in it. There's most, more of it is made of 12C. And those molecules, this is a very simple molecule, but those are just basically stacked up ac across one another, essentially, to, to do this, to make that the lipid synthesis. This decarboxylation actually comes further up. I just didn't have time, room in the slide to put it. Yes, sir? They might want to go back and look at my lecture, because I gave them the fractionation factors each step. Good idea. Mm, yeah. Okay, so lipids have lower carbon isotope values than muscle. <clears throat> you can also take that lipids, and if you want to, you can make glucose out of it. And a lot of animals that don't eat a lot of carbohydrates, like marine mammals, do this, okay? So they take fats, and they can make glucose out of it, all right? We don't do that as much, because our di diets are dominated by carbohydrates, so we don't have to. We have plenty of glucose available to us for work, okay? But if I was a seal, there ain't no carbohydrates to eat in the ocean. But there's a lot of fat, so I can take that fat and convert it into glucose for, via gluconeogenesis. But when you do that, you're taking that isotopic signature of the fat and you're making a glucose pool that is isotopically depleted. So that 12C follows along. So an animal that eats a lot of fat might have a lower carbon isotope value than an animal that doesn't eat a lot of fat. Okay? Because it's its pool for doing all this stuff has been basically contaminated with lipid carbon. Does that make sense? Okay. So when I ask 
this preference for the C12? Is it when the pool is large, when the fire bay pool is large? Or is it, because it isn't, you have a certain placement of carbon too, so it's always going to probably be taking whatever carbon is on that certain placement, right? Yes. Yes, and that's, um, that's a good point in general. All these sorts of reactions, these are all, and I've driven most of them as such, but they're all two-way streets, and they're really all driven by concentration, okay? So yes, th whether they're going this way or that way depends on whether the animal needs this or that, okay? And how much of this and that it has, right? So that's a really good, good point, general point. So the point here is that I just mentioned is that like, if you're studying this, right, that doesn't eat that, then you can kind of take this out of the equation and you can just focus on fat and protein, right? So no little natural history. Don't assume it works the same for every single animal. Now, if you're studying bears, unfortunately, they're like the greatest omnivore on the planet besides ourselves. You have to consider all these things. But if you're studying an animal that eats largely a protein or lipid and lipid rich diet like a marine mammal, then the carbohydrate sort of glucose pool thing, this can just be erased. And really, this is your major pathway into the top of glycolysis. All right, so natural history matters. Think about what your animal eats. Think about if it was walking around in the forest, what its food ingredient th label would look like in terms of protein, carbohydrates, and fats. All right. And as I mentioned, we measure proteins largely in animals. We don't really usually measure a lot of fats. Okay, and proteins are made of two different things. They're made of, they're made of amino acids, but those amino acids can be classified into two different types. You have your non-essential amino acids, very simple amino acids like glycine, which is the simplest amino acid. <coughs> and they can come from anywhere. So we can use any of those things. We can route them directly in from dietary protein. We can use carbon from carbohydrates, and we can use carbon from lipids to build them from scratch, de novo, like baking a cake, our, our bodies can do this. And then of course, the second class of amino acids are essential amino acids, and those have to come from dietary protein, okay? They have to come from dietary protein because we can't make them de novo, they're essential. But our endosymbionts living in our guts can make them de novo. Prokaryotes can make them de novo. So one of the things that we're studying in, in my lab right now is how important gut microbiomes are for essential amino acid synthesis and how much they share those essential amino acids with their hosts, okay? So we're trying to figure out how important this is versus that for the essential amino acid class. And it turns out, I'll just tell you, I don't know if we'll get to it at the end of the day, it's important. It can be five to 60% depending on the essential amino acid comes from your gut microbiome. Do you take it as a whole or can you separate out specific? Like it, for, for you, do you just do all the microbes in the gut or do you know individual microbes? That that's the next thing. That's why I have to go home and write a, pre a proposal for NSF that's due in a month about. Yeah. We're trying to figure out which micro, microbes are basically responsible for doing this yeah. or if all of them can do it equally. Yeah. Another, yes. Okay, another thing, point I just want to make, you know, as long as we're on, on amino acids, is that even though gut microbes, microbes in general, can make essential amino acids de novo, it costs them a lot more energy and it takes them a lot more time to do it. Okay? So this is non-essential amino acids here. This is the steps to synthesize. This is how much ATP and NADP it, makes, it takes to make these things. Non-essentials are pretty cheap to make. Essentials for microbes are pretty expensive to make. But they can make them when they need to. So will that shift as you, as the human, are incorporating or not incorporating the essential amino acids in your diet? So if you decrease it, are they going to have to jack it up? Mm. Or is it not, not, not connected that way? You mean if we decrease the amount of dietary protein, does the, do they jack it up? Yeah. Yes. And that's what we do. We do experiments like 5% dietary protein, 40% dietary protein, and then we see what the budget's like in each of those experiments. Given this diagram here, if you were to feed an animal system a very rich protein diet so that it was getting all the essential and all of the non-essential uh, amino acids, would they waste their time synthesizing their own non-essential? 
I don't know. That's a great question. And um, my guess is that you're always going to have, so a high protein diet for an animal, like a kangaroo rat, would be like 30% protein. In fact, we've, we've tried to feed lab mice 45% protein diets and they die. It's like, they're, that's like uh, their kidneys just go to kaput and their livers go kaput. So I'm guessing at 30% protein, a good portion is going to be directly routed into tissues, but you're always going to have some of that is going to come from carbohydrates because carbohydrates are still going to dominate the diet. So there's always going to be a signal in the non-essential amino acids from non-protein sources. Another important point I want to make here is that most tissues that you have are made of non-essential amino acids. I mean, all the tissues you have are made of non-essential amino acids for the most part. 60 to 72% of the amino acids in your tissues come from non-essential amino acids. That makes a lot of evolutionary sense, doesn't it? <laughs> You're not going to build your tissues with stuff you can't make. And the, the great analogy here is the United States not anymore, but 15 years ago used to be reliant on lots of foreign oil. <laughs> and we've kind of changed that now. Thanks, thank God for all the oil rigs that you see as you fly from Salt Lake to Albuquerque. But we've changed that now. So you're, you're, don't be stupid. Don't try to make things that you need out of things that you can't make yourself. <laughs> Evolutionarily, do we have any idea of our microbiome incorporation? Like, did we pick these things up because of this? We have no idea. No idea. I mean, I don't, it's been, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, so I'm not really interested in humans, because humans are kind of, eh. Yeah, I guess Enough people idea. study them, you know, and they have a lot more money than I do, so I'd leave the humans alone. So they can do a lot more things that I can't do. But, and we don't really have protein deficient diets for the most part. But wild animals, lots of wild animals, because most animals are herbivores, I have protein deficient diets. So my interest really is in the wild animal portion. I will say that um, this evolution of C4 grasses, seven million years ago, that was discovered by one of our isopopes, Turi, right? That led to the abundance of a really, sh I'm not gonna say that because I'm on film, bad quality resource on the landscape, grasses, that were really bad to eat. And so there might have been some microbiome evolution that occurred right there because all of a sudden you had this new abundant resource that was bad quality that you had to learn how to effectively eat. And we know it changed tooth morphology, we know it changed all sorts of things, but I'm guessing if we had a way to figure that out, it also changed the gut microbiome relationship for mammals. That would be the cover of science. <laughs> yeah. How many microbiomes are been sequenced for the, the range of animals you're interested in? Or how many in general? None. Oh, not, no, there's some. Not a ton. Most of them are domesticated animals because a lot, of, a lot of the biomedical research is done on domesticated animals. It's just like this morning. Most of the stuff that Terry was talking about with turnover is done on like sheep and llamas and cows and pigs. And what's right. the diversity of, of species? A lot. Like cereals. Uh, we, from our feeding experiment, we had 45,000 OTUs in one animal. Lots. So, of course, we're not looking at that taxonomic resolution because I don't even know what that means, really, because like 45,000. Are those species? What are those? Like, who knows? But at the phyla level, we're taking a look at that, and then we're going to go down to the family level, hopefully. All right, I got to keep going because you guys are asking way too many questions. I only have a half hour left. But that's great. I love your questions. Okay. So, let's, mm, let's uh, this happens to me every year. It's like, oh my God, 30 minutes left. Let's, we're not even to nitrogen yet. Let's talk about where amino acids come from in these two important metabolic pathways, glycolysis and the TCA cycle, okay? So again, glucose to acetyl-CoA is the glycolytic. That's the glycolytic pathway. These are the two important intermediaries. Like I mentioned, there's like eight in here. I'm just showing you the two most important ones because these two lead to the production of these three non-essential glycolytic, glucogenic amino acids, okay? That would be alanine, serine, and glycine. Okay, so those are where those three non-essentials come from. <clears throat> the TCA cycle, okay, again, 12 intermediaries, I'm just showing two, alpha-ketoglutarate and oxaloacetate, lead to the production of these 
other non-essential amino acids, the ones we can make. These are called ketogenic amino acids. So things like aspartate or aspartic acid, glutamate or glutamic acid, glutamine, arginine, proline, those all come from the TCA cycle. Okay, so those are our two classes, the glycogenic ones and the ketogenic ones, coming from the two most important pathways. And of course, there's essential amino acids, okay, things we can't make that just have to come in from our diet or have to be shared with us from our gut microbiomes. And I'm not listing all the amino acids, right? There's 22 out there or something. People discover them occasionally. They can win Nobel Prizes. But these ones that I'm showing up here are about 12 or 13. They represent 90 to 95% of most of your tissues. So these are the major players. These are the amino acids driving the bus, okay? All right, and it's also the ones I can measure. That's another reason I'm listening. <laughs> I can measure the individual isotope compositions of each of these. So that's another reason why they're up here, because they're the major ones in, in the tissues. All the other ones are trace. They're important for certain body functions, don't get me wrong, but they're considered trace amino acids. Okay? Okay. 